Hi there, Miss Barber here. This lesson is titled The Fundamental Theorem of Calculus. We now establish the precise relationship between differentiation and integration. The Fundamental Theorem of Calculus shows that the two major branches of calculus, differentiation and integration, are inverses of one another. Suppose f is continuous and defined for t equal to or greater than a. Then for x equal to or greater than a, let g of x equal the integral from a to x of f of t dt. The function g gives the net area between the graph of f and the t-axis on the closed interval from a to x. We use the dummy variable t since x is used as the upper limit of integration. Let's explore. We have previously shown that the integral from 0 to x t squared dt is equal to x cubed over 3 for any x equal to or greater than 0. So, for f of t equals t, where t is equal to or greater than 0, g of x equals x cubed over 3. Now, observe that g is differentiable and g prime of x, that's the derivative, is equal to 3x squared divided by 3, which is equal to x squared, which would be equal to f of x. The area function g is the antiderivative of f. Now we're ready to state the fundamental theorem of calculus 1. If f is continuous on the closed interval from a to b, then g of x equals the integral from a to x of f of t dt is continuous on the closed interval from a to b, differentiable on the open interval from a to b, and g prime of x equals f of x. Example, find f prime of x if f of x equals the integral from negative 1 to x of 1 over the quantity 1 plus t squared dt. By the fundamental theorem of calculus 1, we get f prime of x is equal to 1 over 1 plus x squared. Example, find f double prime of x if f of x equals the integral from x cubed to 0 of t times cosine t dt. Let's observe. We can say f of x is equal to negative the integral from 0 to x cubed, t times cosine t dt. Notice we switch the order of the limits of integration and then change the sign of the integral. Now we'll use the chain rule and we'll get f prime of x is equal to minus x cubed times cosine x cubed but remember, we're using the chain rule, so we need to take the derivative of x cubed, and multiplying that will do times 3x squared. Let's combine like terms. An f prime of x is equal to negative 3. We have x to the fifth because we multiplied x cubed to x squared, and then times cosine of x cubed. Now, we're going to use the product rule to find f double prime of x. f double prime of x is equal to, remember the negative. Now we'll take the derivative of the first function, which was 3x to the fifth, so the derivative would be 15x to the fourth times the second, which is cosine x cubed, plus the first function, 3x to the fifth, times the derivative of cosine x cubed. The derivative of cosine is negative sine. The inside function is x cubed. Using the chain rule again, we must multiply it to the derivative of x cubed, which would be 3x squared. 
Now let's do algebra to simplify. f double prime of x is equal to negative 15x to the fourth times cosine quantity x cubed. Now we have the negative with the sine, distributing the negative, that makes it a plus. 3 times 3 is 9, x to the fifth times x squared, that would be x to the seventh, times sine x cubed. Fundamental Theorem of Calculus 2. If lowercase f is continuous on the closed interval from a to b, then the integral from a to b of lowercase f of x dx is equal to uppercase f of b minus the uppercase f of a, where the uppercase f is any antiderivative of lowercase f. That is, a function uppercase f such that uppercase f prime equals lowercase f. The proof is presented in your notes. Be sure to learn it. And then let's look at notation. Uppercase f of x, straight vertical bar, with b above to the right, and a right below can also be written as uppercase f of b minus uppercase f of a. Example, integrate negative 1 to 3 of the quantity 4 minus x squared dx. We first find the integral, which would be the integral of 4 is 4x minus, and then using the power rule for integration, the integral of x squared would be x to 1 power higher, so x cubed, divided by that same value, which is 3. Now we draw the vertical line and indicate the upper limit of integration is 3, the lower as negative 1. And then we evaluate this. That is, we put in 3 every place there is an x. So you will have 4 times 3 minus 3 cubed divided by 3. And then we subtract the area of the lower bound, which would be minus 4 times where the x was, put in negative 1, minus where the x was, we put in negative 1 again. So negative 1 cubed divided by 3. We'll proceed with some arithmetic. 4 times 3 is 12. 3 cubed divided by 3, that's 27 divided by 3 is 9. Minus 4 times negative 1 is negative 4. Negative 1 cubed is negative. When you have minus negative, it becomes plus. So you have plus 1 third. Let's continue to work from inside parentheses out. 12 minus 9 is 3. Then we have minus. Get a common denominator of 3 for the negative 4. And that sum will be negative 11 thirds. Continuing with the arithmetic, we'll get a common denominator for the 3. That'll give you 9 thirds. Minus minus would be plus our 11 thirds and the sum of those two fractions is 20 thirds. Evaluate the integral from negative 1 half to positive 1 half of the quantity 6x squared plus pi squared times cosine pi x dx. We'll find the integral. The integral of 6x squared using the power rule, specifically for x squared, is one-third x cubed. Six times one-third will give us two. Two x cubed plus pi is a constant, so we still have pi squared. Quick reminder, the integral of cosine a theta d theta is equal to one over a sine a theta plus c. We're going to ignore the plus c because we are now computing a definite integral. Even so, the integral of cosine pi x would then be sine pi x times 1 over pi. Let's simplify. The 2x cubed stays put. 
the pi squared times one over pi leaves you with one pi times sine pi theta. Now we're ready to evaluate upper limit of integration, one half, lower, negative one half. We evaluate at each of those endpoints. We'll start with one half. You have two times where the x was, replace it with the positive one half cubed plus pi times the sine of pi times where the x was one half. Repeat this when we need to subtract the minus one half. So we have minus two times where the x was negative one half cubed plus pi sine of pi times negative one half. Let's compute. Two times one half cubed would be two times one eighth, which is one fourth, plus pi times the sine of pi over two, which is just one. Continuing. Two times negative one half cubed would be two times negative one eighth. The product is negative one fourth, and the sine of negative pi over two is negative one, so we'll end up with pi times negative one. Now let's do the subtraction. One fourth plus pi minus minus gives you a positive one fourth. Minus minus gives you a positive pi, combining like terms, one fourth plus one fourth is one half plus pi plus pi is two pi. Example, evaluate the integral from negative two to positive two of f of x dx, where f of x is the piecewise defined function, one minus x squared for x equal to or less than zero, and x cubed plus one for x strictly greater than zero. We begin by writing the integral from negative two to positive two of f of x dx. Let's write this as a sum of two separate integrals split at zero. The integral from negative two to zero of f of x dx plus the integral from zero to two of f of x dx. Now let's replace the f of x dx with the appropriate piece of the function. So we'll get the integral from negative two to zero of one minus x squared dx for the first piece, add that to the integral from zero to two of the second piece, which is x cubed plus one dx. We'll begin by taking the integral of the first piece, which was one minus x squared. Using the power rule, the integral for that is x minus x cubed divided by three, and we want to evaluate that, zero, negative two. And we will add that to the integral of the second piece. The integral of x cubed is one fourth x to the fourth. The integral of one is x. We will evaluate that with its bounds to zero. Now let's evaluate. We'll do the first piece first, that is, at zero, zero minus zero cubed over three is just zero. Then at negative two, we'll have negative two for the x minus negative two for the x cubed divided by three. Let's repeat this for the second piece. That is, we're gonna evaluate the integral at two. So we've got two to the fourth divided by four plus two and then minus the bottom value is zero. Zero to the fourth over four is zero, plus zero is also zero. Let's continue now with the arithmetic. For the first piece, distributing the negative, minus negative two will be positive two, and then you'll have an odd number of negatives resulting, which will give you eight thirds plus Let's do the arithmetic for the second piece. Two to the fourth, that's 16, divided by four is four, plus two. Let's continue with the arithmetic to finish it up. And the final answer is 
16 thirds. Example, evaluate the integral from 1 to 27 of the quotient t plus 1 divided by the square root of t dt. We're going to do some algebra first. First, we'll re-express the t plus 1 over the square root of t as t plus 1 divided by t to the 1 half. Proceed to do term by term division. That would be t divided by t to the power of 1 half plus 1 divided by t to the power of 1 half. And then let's combine the exponents. For the first term, t to the 1 divided by t to the 1 half it's just t to the 1 half. For the second term, we will take the term from the denominator into the numerator, and in so doing, we'll get a negative t to the minus 1 half. Let's re-express the integral from 1 to 27 of t plus 1 divided by the square root of t dt is equal to the integral from 1 to 27 of t to the 1 half plus t to the negative 1 half dt. Using the power rule for integration, the integral of t to the 1 half, adding 1 to the power will be t to the 3 halves. You have 1 divided by 3 halves. That'll give you 2 thirds t to the 3 halves plus Using the power rule to integrate t to the negative one-half, the result would be 2 times t to the power of positive one-half. Let's evaluate at our endpoints 27 and 1. We'll begin by evaluating our antiderivative at 27. You'll get two-thirds times where t was put in 27 to the power of 3 halves plus two times where t was put in 27 to the power of 1 half. Do this with the value of 1, so we'll have minus two-thirds times 1 to the power of 3 halves plus two times 1 to the power of 1 half. Before proceeding, let me give us a little bit of an algebra refresher. 27 to the 1 half can be written as the square root of 27, which can be written as the square root of 9 times 3. The square root of 9 is 3. So 27 to the 1 half is equal to 3 times the square root of 3. Let's take the 27 to the 1 half and raise that to a power of 3. That would be equal to 3 times the square root of 3 cubed. That's equal to 3 cubed is 27, and you still have the square root of 3 times the square root of 3 times the square root of 3, which would be 3 times the square root of 3. The final result, multiplying the 27 and the 3 together, 81 times the square root of 3. With this algebra refresher in place, we'll continue. And now we'll have 2 thirds times 81 times the square root of 3 plus 2 times 3 times the square root of 3. The 1's a little bit easier to compute. Minus 2 thirds times 1 plus 2. Let's proceed with the arithmetic. 2 times 27 times the square root of 3 plus 6 times the square root of 3 minus 8 thirds. 2 times 27 is 54. So 54 times the square root of 3 plus 6 times the square root of 3 minus 8 thirds. Combining the last two like terms, you'll get 60 times the square root of 3 minus 8 thirds. That is the exact answer.